Hey guys, Carl from Purple Moose Place. Today I'm going to be taking a look at My Little Scythe from designer Hobie Cho and his daughter Vienna, published by Stonemaier Games. This game is a bit of a passion project for Hobie Cho as he was a big fan of Scythe and he really wanted to find a way to sort of reinterpret and change up the game in a way that his daughter Vienna could play along with him and get excitement and enjoyment out of the game, sort of at her own level as well. And what he did was he took the game, switched a few things up, changed a few things, and rethemed it as a sort of My Little Pony game. Well, Jamie Stegmeier of Stonemeyer found out about the game, and rather than telling them to get rid of this game, instead he brought him on and worked with him to create a, an actual version that was published by Stonemeyer Games. And that's what this is that we'll be looking at today. Now, this game is a little bit different than the games I would normally cover on this channel, but as an uncle who has a nephew who's been really getting into board games over the years, I've constantly been eyeing this game as a way to sort of introduce him to sort of more hobby level strategic board games. And also as a lover of Scythe myself, I've been curious to see how much of sort of that core spirit of the big game makes its way into this game and how the changes mix things up a little bit. So with those two things and the ability to have another chance to try out another Altoma Factory solo mode, when I got the opportunity to cover a review copy of this game, I jumped immediately. So what that means is I did receive a review copy of this game, but as always, I will do my best to offer my honest opinion on the game. And with that being said, let's head down to the table to see how the solo game plays through, and then I'll meet you back up here to let you know what I think. To set up a solo game of My Little Scythe, begin by placing the board out on the table. And then you'll go ahead and set up the game as if you were playing a two-player game with a few tweaks here and there. So first, take a player sheet and then choose a player color. In this case, I will be playing with the purple monkey. So I'm going to take the two minis for my color, the player pawn in my color, four trophy tokens in my player color, which I will add to my player board on the four trophy slots. A pie token in my player color, which gets placed where you see the arrows here on the track at level three. And finally, this heart token or the friendship marker in my player color. And this will again be placed where you see the arrows on the track at level three. You will then also take one of these pie fight dials as well as one of the quest cards at random. So I'm going to shuffle these quest cards and I'll explain what the quest card does later. But for right now, I am going to take this one, which says passive. And I get a trophy. It says pie fight victory. Earn the trophy by using one or more magic spells or pies in a pie fight. And then next we need to set up the AI player. The AI player does not need a player board or a pawn, but we will take the two minis in the player color. For this game, I will be using the black dog player for the AI. So they will get their minis, four trophy tokens. And then again, their pie and friendship tokens get placed as well. Their pie starts at the same spot mine does. But in the case of the AI, their friendship token is going to start at level five and it will stay there for the game. It should be mentioned that the AI starting here at level three on the pie track is only for the normal level of difficulty, which I will be using for this playthrough. And then finally, the AI will get this AI deck. So we'll give those a good shuffle and we will set those off to the side as well. Now that we've set up both ourselves and the AI player, we're going to finish setting up the board. So we need to take these magic spell cards, shuffling them up as well, and placing these off to the side here in the magic spell area. And we will take one of those cards for ourselves to begin the game. So we're going to start with a level four magic spell card. The next we will shuffle the quest cards. I'm sorry, earlier I mentioned the quest card as being this card here, but this is actually called a personality card, not a quest card. So these are the actual quest cards. We will be shuffling these 
and we will place them down here in the quest card location on the board. Next, we will take the make power up tiles, shuffling those, placing them up here in the top corner, and then do the same thing with the move power up tiles. Placing those up here in the top corner as well. We can then place out all of the dice on the board and all of the resources, meaning gems, apples, and quest tokens off to the side of the board as well. Finally, we need to seed the board for the beginning of the game. And to do that first, we will need to place our base camp tiles on the board. This is going to be where our minis are going to be starting for the game and also where they will return to at certain points throughout the game. When playing a two-player game, we will be using this location down here and that location up at the top of the board. So I'm going to place my camp right here, placing both of my miniatures on that camp. And I will place the AI's base camp up here at the top of the board, placing both of the AI minis at that location. Finally, to seed the resources for the start of the game, we're going to use this tile right here. So this will be placed in the center of the board and I'm going to spin it to make sure that the rotation is random and then we will flip it over and seed the board as shown on this picture only at the locations that have our characters or our base camps on them. So we're going to place a quest token here, an apple here, and a gem here. And at the top of the board, we will place a gem here, an apple here, and a quest token here. Once the board has been seated in that manner, we can remove that tile from the board as it will not be needed for the rest of the game. All right, we are now all set up to play a game of My Little Scythe solo against the AI. But before we do that, obviously, I need to explain sort of what the goal of the game is, how a turn generally plays out, and then a little bit about how the AI takes their turns. So My Little Scythe is going to play out over a series of rounds, taking turns between the player and the AI, until either the player or the AI manages to place four trophies up here in the top right corner. And as soon as one player places all four of their trophies, the other player, meaning the AI or the player themselves, will get one more turn to place as many trophies as they can. And whoever has four trophies at the end of the game will be the winner. In the case that both have four trophies, the player with the highest friendship level, noted here on this track, will be the winner. And if the friendship level is also tied, the player who is at that moment controlling the most resources, meaning gems and apples, on the board will be declared the winner. And if there is still a tie, then the players will share the victory. So in order to score or to place these trophies up here in the top right corner, there are a variety of different objectives that must be met. And I'm just going to walk through all eight of them up here. The first one here is going to be a friendship level of eight. If we can get to level eight on the friendship track, we will place a trophy in that location. The next trophy is going to be placed when we have two power up tiles on our player board. And that means one move power up tile and one make power up tile. And I'll explain how that works in a minute when we get into the gameplay itself. Next, if we can ever have three of those magic spell cards, we will be able to place a trophy there. If we've ever successfully completed two of these quest cards, we will be able to place a trophy. These two locations work the same way, but what we will need to do is either deliver four gems or four apples to the castle in the center of the board. And we can only do each of these once. The next one will be winning a pie fight. And finally, if we can ever get eight or more pies on the pie track, we will be able to place a trophy there. In addition to these normal rules, we as the player also have this personality card. And in our case, we've got a special trophy that we can place. And it says pie fight victory. 
instead of having to win a pie fight, instead, I can earn a trophy, meaning this pie fight victory trophy, by using one or more magic spells or pie in a pie fight. I do not need to win. So that means I just need to participate in a pie fight in order to win my pie fight trophy. So that's actually going to be very, very easy for me to place that pie. And this card is going to change every game. So this is unique to my player for this game. The AI player is actually going to place pies in a slightly different way. It can place a trophy based on having eight pies on the pie track and or winning a pie fight. But the rest of the trophies that the AI is going to place will be done in a different way. And I'll explain that a little bit more when we talk about how the AI plays the game. But first, let's get into how our normal turns will play out. So if we look at this player board, you will see that we have three main actions, move, seek, and make. And on my turn, I'm going to use my pawn to select either this one, one of these two, or one of these three actions. So I have a total of six actions that I can choose from. But when I place my pawn there, on the next turn, I am not allowed to use the same action. I will need to move my pawn to a different space on my player board. So let's take a look at what these actions will do. With a move action, I can move both of my pawns either up to two spaces or move only one space, but I can carry as many resources as I want to with me on that one space move. Seeking, I can choose either the top or bottom action, and I'm going to roll the dice that are shown on the board. So in this case, I would roll two apple dice, one gem, and one quest die. Here I would roll two gems, one apple, and one quest die. And then based on the colors that come up on those dice, we will place gems, apples, and quest tokens out on the board as shown. When we are taking the seek action, apples and gems can be placed on any location on the board, including locations that already have other tokens, other resources, or any player character minis on that space. However, a quest token can never be placed on a tile or on a location that already has a mini or a quest tile on it. It could be placed where there's an apple or a gem, but nothing else can be on the space where we're placing a quest tile. In addition, anytime we place a resource, means an apple or a gem, on a space containing the AI miniatures, we will increase our friendship on the friendship track by one. Finally, we have the make action. And the make action has three options. The first one is we can spend two apples that are found on any space containing one of our minis to increase our pies by two on the pie track. We could spend two gems to take one magic spell card, or we could spend one apple and one gem to take either the move or the make power-up cards. And those move and make power-up cards, I will show to you as we do them later in the game, but they are basically going to upgrade our abilities for move and the make action. And when we do that, we're going to draw three of them. We're going to choose the one that we want to add to our board. In addition to these normal actions, there are a few other things that are going to happen while we play. And the main things that we still need to talk about are how we are going to deliver our resources to the castle in the center, how we are going to activate these quest cards, and how we are going to have a pie fight with the AI character. So first, in order to bring a resource into this castle, we are going to use a move action, and we will need to use the move action that only allows us to move one space so that we can bring resources with us when we move. And we can move directly into the castle, or we can move from one of these portal spaces into the castle. These portal spaces are going to act as if they were adjacent to other portal spaces, and the castle counts as one of the portal spaces, as you can see by this portal in the door of the castle. So if I am on this space with the resources needed to score either the four crystal trophy or the four apple trophy, I can move directly into the center space, delivering the resources. And then after I've delivered, I can never stay on this space, so I will immediately return to my home base. 
And whenever I come back to my base camp, I will always have the choice of either increasing my pie count by two or taking a magic spell card. Also, I mentioned before that on a successive turn, we can never take the same action twice. However, when one of my characters returns to the base camp, my action pawn will be removed from the card so we can again choose any action we would like to on the following turn. Quest cards will be activated anytime we end our turn or end our movement on a space containing one of these quest tokens. And what we're going to do is we're going to turn over the top card. And all of these cards, actually I'll show you one right now, are going to contain three options. There's always going to be a sort of positive option we can choose. There's always going to be one that's a little bit more negative that we can choose, or we can choose to do neither of those and just simply do what it says in the no thanks area. If we choose the no thanks area, however, we will not count that quest towards our trophy of completing two quests. In order to complete two quests, we have to have chosen either of the top two choices. And if we do that on two separate quest cards, we will place a trophy on that location of the board. Finally, the last thing we can do is have a pie fight. If we ever move into a space containing the AI mini, we are going to activate or trigger a pie fight. And the way that works is this. We're going to use our pie fight dial and we're going to select the number of pies that we would like to use in that battle. And we can never use more pies than our current level on the pie track. In addition to the pies that we are spending, we can add a single magic spell card for each of our own minis that are taking part in that pie fight. And we would just slide that card in here like this. So say for example, I decided to use three of my own pies and slide this in for four. I'm using a total of seven pies for that battle. In the case of a regular multiplayer game, the defender would also do the exact same thing. However, with the AI, we're going to turn over a card and the bottom of the AI's card will tell us exactly how many pies they will try to use, assuming they have enough on the track, and whether or not they will draw cards randomly from the top of the magic spell card deck. In addition to doing this, the attacker is also going to lower their friendship level by one anytime they start a pie fight. Once both people have completely determined their attack strength or the number of pies they will be using, we will compare the two and whoever has the higher number will win the pie fight. If they haven't already, they will then place their trophy on the pie fight section at the top of the board. And the loser or the losing team will send any miniatures from that pie fight back to their base location. Again, if it's me, I will get to choose either to increase my pies by two or to take one magic spell card. In the case of the AI, they will never take a magic spell card, so they will always increase the level of pies by two. Finally, relating to the trophies, it is worth mentioning that if your friendship ever drops below a three, means two, one, or zero, as long as your friendship is at that level, you will never be able to place any trophies. So you will need to increase your friendship either by completing certain quests that will allow you to raise your friendship or by placing resources directly on the opponent's spaces during a seek action. Now the AI is going to play things a little bit differently. I've already mentioned the AI can only place normal trophies on the eight pie section for collecting eight pies or for winning a pie fight. It's also worth mentioning that when the AI does initiate a pie fight, they will not use their friendship. Their friendship value will never change throughout the game. So in the case of a tie, I do need to make sure that I have five or more friendship or I will lose all ties. Otherwise, the AI is only going to place trophies when as a team, they collectively hold four or more resources at the start of their turn. And if at the start of their turn, they have four or more resources on the spaces they occupy, they will spend four of those resources to place a trophy on the leftmost available space that is still open to them. And they will always spend resources starting with their primary or main seeker, starting with quest tokens, then gems, and then apples. And then if the primary seeker has spent all of the tokens on its own space, the other seeker will spend the remaining resources in order to hit that four. 
And if the AI does spend four resources to place a trophy, that is the end of their turn. However, if they're not able to buy a trophy on their turn, they will then turn over the top card in this deck. And this is going to show a variety of different things on these cards. Every card is going to have this sort of movement section, but some cards will have these pie sections. Some cards will have these sort of seeker or place sections. And some will have these battle sections at the bottom. These battle sections, again, are only going to be used during a pie fight. Otherwise, we're only looking at the top sort of two thirds of the card. If we see a pie or several pies at the top of a card, we will instantly raise their pie level on the pie track. If we see something that looks like this, it is just like a seek action that we have taken and we will seed the board as shown on this card. Otherwise, all we are going to do is we are going to follow this movement to move both of their seeker miniatures on the board. And the way we're going to do that is we'll start with the primary seeker figure and we want to follow one of the patterns that's shown on the card in such a way that the AI increases their resources available to them as much as possible. If more than one path would allow them to increase their resources by the same amount, and that includes zero as well, the primary seeker or the seeker who's moving first will always aim towards the lowest letter or starting with A. So in this case, if they were all the same, the primary seeker would go in that direction, assuming that it could move in that direction. And they will follow that path for as far as they can until they hit the edge of the board or they hit a castle, the castle in the center of the board, or they hit one of my player miniatures. If they hit one of my miniatures, they will either enter my space and start a pie fight or stop one space before me if they have less than three pies available to them. The second seeker will do the exact same thing except they're working in reverse order with letters. So they will always try to go closest to F whenever possible. So I hope that all makes sense, but I'm sure there are some small details that will start to become a bit clearer when we get into the gameplay. So I'm going to go ahead right now and get into play. And to figure out who's going to go first, I'm just going to roll the quest die. If I get a white, gray, or green, we'll say the AI goes first. If I get a blue, red, or yellow, we will say that it's me who is going first. So I roll the yellow on the quest die, so I will be going first. All right, so I see here there's a quest token, and I could move right there right now. But if I move to that quest token, my other character is probably either going to end up with this gem or this apple. But it's likely that I'm not going to be able to complete a quest with only one gem or one apple. So I am actually going to try and seek to try and add more resources in this area so I can pick something else up before activating that quest token. So I'm going to begin by placing my action pawn on this top seek section, meaning I will roll two apples, one gem, and one quest die, and we roll and we get two white apples, one gray gem, and one gold quest, which really doesn't help me much because that means I need to place two apples somewhere in the sort of snowy region. And I wanna do it in such a way that they're not going to immediately get them. So I will place both of those there for right now. I'm going to place one gem in the gray area, which is also up near them. And I will place that over here. And then I'm going to place, place one quest token somewhere in the golden area. So I'm going to place that, yeah, I'll put it right there. And that is the end of my turn. So now we take the AI's turn. We turn over the top card of the AI deck. There is nothing printed at the top, so we don't have to do anything special. And the AI in this case can only move up and to the left, down and to the left, or directly to the right. And because the AI is off the board, this A and this B are not possible at this time. So they're actually both going to move in the same direction, which means both of these minis will move one, two, three, 
and they always carry with them everything they pass through. So they're both going to end up at this location with the quest token. Now I did forget to mention, and I will mention it now, I'm going to use the darker mini as my primary seeker moving forward. All right, so it is my turn again. They're going to get those apples. There's no way for me to get there fast enough to stop them. So I'm going to take a move action and I will move one of my minis here and I will move the second one here, which means we now have control of an apple and a gem and I'm going to trigger this quest, which says, Dispel. I can pay one magic spell to gain two friendship, or I can embrace, meaning embrace the dark magic. And if I embrace the dark magic, I move all apples and gems from any space to an adjacent space, but I'm going to lose one friendship, and I'm already at level three. So if I lose any friendship, I cannot get trophies, so I do not want to do that. The other option I can simply do is say no thanks, and I would just get one friendship. It's early enough in the game and they're far enough away that I don't really care too much about that magic spell. So I do want to activate this quest because it's going to work towards getting me my first trophy. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to discard this magic spell. And that's going to let me move my friendship up two spaces. All right, now it's the AI's turn again. The AI turns their card over. First, they're going to get one pi. So the AI's pi goes up by one. Now, in order to increase their resources to the best of their ability, there's only one direction they can move, which is this C direction. So that means the primary seeker will be moving one space to the right. And again, it always takes everything with it. So it takes that quest token with it. Now, the secondary seeker, no matter which direction it moves, is not going to be adding any resources to their total number of resources. So it wants to be moving the direction that is closest to the end of the alphabet or closest to F. So it's going to move in this E direction, and that means they are moving one space down here. All right, now it is my turn again. I need to start working on more quests. If I get a second quest, I can get a trophy. I would love to have more resources. I only have one of each right now. Boosting pies would not be a bad idea. Spending resources to get power is also not a bad idea. But I, let's, let's go ahead and get more resources first. So again, I'm going to seek. Uh, I don't want more apples on the board. Well, it doesn't matter because they expend any kind of resource. But yeah, so I will just do the top seek action again. Two apples, a gem, and a quest. We roll. I get a yellow and a blue apple, a green gem, and a blue quest. That's not very good because, well, the yellow apple is great because I can put that there. And a green quest isn't going to affect me much. I will put it here so it's near a portal. Then I have to place an apple. Sorry, that should have been a gem, not a quest. I have to place an apple and a quest in a blue area. And the problem is all of the blue areas are surrounding this character. Means whatever I place there is very likely that they're going to take on their next turn. So I am getting close to the eight on friendship. I don't really want to give them the quest, but I can place the quest here and hope that the AI card doesn't allow it to move in that direction. And I'm actually going to give them the apple. I know that they're going to get four tokens and they will place their first trophy, but that's moving me much, much closer towards that eight friendship, which means I get a trophy as well if I can hit that. So I'm actually going to do that. I don't know if that was smart, but we'll see how the game plays out. All right, so it is the AI's turn again but they have four resources on their spaces right now. So they are not going to turn over a card and instead they will spend all four of those resources. It means this quest, two apples, and one more apple. 
to place their first trophy. And again, it goes in the leftmost position. So they have one trophy out on the board, and that is the end of their turn. I'm going to take a move action. And I'm going to move here with this character, and we will use this portal to move to this portal, carrying the apple with us, which means we trigger this quest token. And we turn over the next card. And we see Covert Critters. So we can help the forest by paying two apples. And if we pay two apples, we gain two friendship and one pie. We can do dirty tricks, which means we remove an apple or gem or quest from the board. And we don't lose any friendship for doing that. Um, it would have been nice on the previous turn because we could have stopped them from placing a trophy. But for this turn, that doesn't help. Or we can say no thanks and simply gain an apple or a gem for visiting. But I want both friendship and I want to have this card. Now, the problem is we can only place one trophy per turn. But if we qualify for two trophies and on the next turn we don't get a different trophy, then we can place on that turn anyway. So again, I am going to take this and pay two apples to gain two friendship and a pie. So I will pay from this apple and this apple. We get one pie and we get two friendship, which means we have unlocked this trophy and we've also gotten this trophy. So I'm going to first place a trophy on the friendship level, which goes there. And that is the end of my turn. So now the AI takes their turn. They don't have any resources to place a trophy, so they are going to turn over their card and they are placing resources this turn. So they're going to place an apple up here. They will place a gem down here. They will place another gem up here and they will place a quest token right here but unfortunately quest tokens cannot be placed where there is a mini so that quest token will not be placed and next they will look at their movement they're trying to move one space in any direction for the primary seeker there is only one direction that has a resource so it will move there for the other seeker there are no resources in any direction so they're going to refer to the letters and they will move to the f direction meaning they move to this space right here. And that is the end of their turn. Now, I only have right now available to me one gem, which isn't going to help me in any sort of way. And I can't move because I just moved last turn. So I am instead going to seek because I also can't make anything not having anything near me. Um, I do have a lot of gems near me, so I'm actually going to go for the bottom seek action so I can place more gems. So I roll two gems, one apple, and one search quest. And we've got a blue and a yellow gem, a white apple, and a gray quest. So the blue gem I want to place in a spot where it's far and not in a direction that a seeker can get there. So I place that there. The yellow gem I will place right there. So that's very easy for him to have that. And the apple has to go in a white location. Let's place it here so it's away from all of the seekers. And finally, the quest in the gray section Again, I will place here, so there's no way for the AI to get that. All right, and now because we haven't scored any other trophies yet, but I still have these two quest cards from last turn, I will place a trophy on the quest section of the board. All right, and then it is the AI's turn. He doesn't have enough resources to place a trophy, so they will look at the top card. First things first, they're going to gain two pies. And then they're going to attempt to move that way, that way, or that way. 
Looking at the primary seeker, you can see that there's one resource up in that corner, but there's also a resource in the A direction as well, and he will favor the A direction. So he's going to take this gem and move here. For the other seeker, there are no resources in any of those directions. Uh, that's not true. If he moves three down in this direction, one, two, three, he's actually going to take the gems that I was just working very hard to build. Yeah, that's bad. Okay, but that's fine. So that is the AI's turn, and they do have four resources. I've got a lot of friendship, and I've already got my friendship trophy, so I don't mind losing friendship in a pie fight because I can't lose my friendship trophy. So I'm going to move. I don't have any magic spell cards, which is a problem. But I do have more pies than they do. So we could get lucky. So I am moving. I'm going to move him there so I'm protecting that gem. It doesn't make sense to have both of my minis at this battle because, again, I don't have any magic spell cards and that's the only thing that would matter for. So I will move him into there to trigger a pie fight. And remembering that I've got this passive card that says I get a pie fight victory by using one or more magic spells or pies in a pie fight. So I don't need to win. I just need to take part in a pie fight, which is what's going to happen right now. I'm going to set my dial to six because that gives me the best chance of winning this pie fight. I don't have any magic cards to put in there, but he only has four pies. So as long as he doesn't draw any cards and he doesn't get a super high pie value in his next card, I'm going to win this fight. So let's see what happens. We turn this over and he says seven pies, which is great because he only has four. So he's going to use four pies. He cannot use seven pies. So actually I'm going to win the battle. My pies go to zero because I use six of them. His pies go to zero because he used four of them. I did have to move that down one because I initiated the attack and he gets sent back to his base camp and instantly receives two pies for moving back. Now I own those gems again, which is great for me. And also, even better, I get to place a trophy on the pie fight section of the board. And then it is once again the AI player's turn. They do not have enough resources to place a trophy, so they will turn over the next card. And the first thing they're going to get is two pies. So this will move up to four. And now we're going to take a look at movement. They're going up right, straight left, or down right. For him, he cannot go straight left. He could go down right or up right, but there's only a resource here, so he will move to that location. The other seeker in its current location can only move in the B direction, but there's also a resource there, so they would do it anyway. They go there, and that is the end of their turn. All right, so it is my turn. And I do have four gems, but the problem is it's going to take two move actions to bring them to the castle, and I can't do that. They also don't have any apples, so I can't buy any power for now. I could buy magic cards one at a time, in the hope of getting three magic cards, but that's gonna take some time as well. So I'm going to do a seek action. I've already got a lot of gems, so I'm going to aim for more apples this time. And I will roll two apples, a gem, and a quest. So I get two gray apples, whoops. A green gem and a gray quest. So we'll start with the green gem. I'll just give it to my guy. Uh, two gray apples. Yeah, I'll put them both right here because it's going to be a while before they can get there, and that's not bad. I could always go there with a portal myself. And then I place one quest in gray as well. Can't be where they are. It can't be 
where another quest is. It means it's got to be one of these three. Let's put it there. That way we don't have more than two resources on any one spot. But unfortunately, the AI does have four resources this turn. So they're going to spend these two gems and these two apples to place a trophy on the track. And they will place that here on the next spot. And that means also that they don't get to take their turn. They will not turn over a card. So it is my turn. I'm going to move action. I will move this person here. Uh, no. I'm going to move them here and move him there. Yes, that works nicely. Because on the next turn, I can use the apple and the extra gem to buy a power up card just in case. And then I can go back to my move and hopefully bring those crystals to the castle to get my fourth trophy. But now it's the AI's turn. They will turn over one card. All right, they are going to be seating the board like this. So we're going to place a gem here, an apple here, another apple right there with them, and a quest token right here. And then they are both going to try and move one space in any direction to get an item. The primary seeker is going to move here because there is a resource there. And the other seeker, ah, I'm wrong. The other seeker is going to move here because there's also a quest there. So again, they are at three resources. And that is the end of their turn. It is my turn. I'm going to make and I'm going to spend an apple and a gem to take a power up and I'm going to aim for the move power up because that could potentially be the easiest thing to help right now. So I get to take three of those and we will look at those and decide which one to take. So we've first got the Royal Chariot card and what this is going to do is a regular move action but also as one of my moves I can move one of my seekers directly to the castle from any space to complete a delivery which would be helpful except we can still only move one space. So he only has three gems. I could move him here, but then even if he moves directly to the castle, I would need one more movement. So that's not super helpful yet, but it could be. Next, we've got Wings of Friendship, which says as one of your moves, move one of your seekers directly to your other seeker space and add a friendship. I don't need the friendship anymore, but Moving to another seeker space means I could move him directly here and that would actually be great because I could bring this gem with me to this space and then his move action would bring the gems in there. So I'm going to take that but before I do let me just show you the third option and that is this pie cannon and basically this is just going to let me add two pies before the start of any pie fight. I'm not planning on having another pie fight so that's not useful for me right now. So I'm going to take this Wings of Friendship. I will add that to my player board in the move section. And the other two power-ups will be placed at the bottom of the power-up deck. All right, so now it is the AI's turn. They have three resources, so they do not place a trophy. And they will do this. They are once again seeding the board. So they start with a gem here, a gem here, an apple here, and a quest token here. And they will again try to move one space in any direction to get some resources. Clearly, this one is going to move here because there are two resources there for them to get. The primary seeker cannot pick up any resources. So they're going to move in the A direction, moving this way. Okay, it is again my turn. So I'm going to take this new move action that says again, 
As one of my moves, move one of my seekers directly to the other seeker space and gain a friendship. So this is my first move action. Moving to that space and bringing the gem with him. Moving this back up to eight. And now for my second action, my other seeker will take all four gems using the portal and they will go straight into the center space turning in those four gems to place the final trophy on that location which means the ai does get one more turn to hopefully try and pick up more trophies so they do have four resources you spend one two three four to place their first trophy here and again on the last turn if they could they would do that over and over and over again placing as many trophies as possible but they only have this one apple resource remaining so it is not possible for any more trophies to be placed and that is the end of the game I have successfully beaten the AI on the normal difficulty level. So while we're down here, I do like to take a look at the components. And the components in this game on a whole are, are wonderful. I, I, you've seen most of the things already out on the table. The board is beautiful. If I have any complaints at all about any of the components, the board is a little bit big. Just given the size of the minis, you really could fit a lot of them. I suppose at a high player count, it might get a problem if you have a bunch of them coming together for a pie fight. But in general, the board is a little bit bigger than it needs to be, in my opinion, as it does, as you see, take up a lot of table space. But it looks beautiful. Everything on it pops. I can't really complain about it, just that it would be nice if it was just a slight bit smaller. The dice are very nicely made. Plastic dice, they roll very well. I do like the sort of marbling color of the quest die. All of the symbols are very clear. All of the colors for me are very clear. I don't know for sure that if you were colorblind, if there would be any issues. I'm assuming that they did their work to figure that out, but that is something you want to keep in mind if you are colorblind. Um, the cards we've seen, the magic spell cards are all the same, except just a different number of pies on each of them, ranging from two to five. They're nice cards. They're, they're nicely colored. There's not a whole lot of information. It's just, like I said, a number of pies. But yeah, they look nice. The power-up cards, you've seen some of the move cards. Let me show you a couple of the make cards since we didn't get a chance to see that during the game. Um, for example, this card changes this top make action into also getting a friendship instead of only getting two pies. Um, here's one, the Redeem Magician. This changes the center action that instead of just a card you get a card and a friendship uh, here's the iron pie chef which gets you three pies instead of two pies when you're baking here's the stingy baker which only requires one apple to make two pies so all of these are changing things in very simple different ways and it's nice that they've always got sort of these red lines there to show you exactly what's changing from the abilities that are printed directly on the card these as compared to the other cards are actually not cards. They're nice thick tiles, which is great because they will be on your board and you will be interacting with them a lot. So it's nice because they will sort of stand up to the repeated usage of them in the game. The quest cards you've seen are very nice. It is very cool to me that they all have different artwork that ties in with what the sort of story is that goes with the card. If you're familiar with the base game of Scythe, this is a lot like the encounter cards in, the, in that game. And it's, it's interesting that they still manage to keep a little bit of the theme followed by a sort of a choose your own adventure story choice that ties in with the game. And it fits the theme of the game very nicely. So I like those cards quite a bit. Um, and yeah, sort of the last thing I should talk about are the minis themselves and the insert as I usually do, but I wanna start with the minis because I, I love what they've done with these minis and I'll show you more in just a minute. But these minis are really, really nicely done. Super sort of thematic, super 
cartoony but cartoony in a good way lots of great detail i cannot wait to paint these minis to make them really stand out while i play but i am incredibly happy with the level of detail and the design of these minis and while we're talking about that let's take a look at the insert because the rest of the minis are still in the insert but before we get to the minis i want to show the bottom insert this is the insert that goes in the bottom of the box and it's really really well designed the different power-up cards can go in these locations here you've got a space for the ai deck the personalities deck the quest deck these are the base camp tiles your quest tiles go here your apples go here your gems go here your magic spell cards go there the pie fight dials fit very nicely there in the corner everything is very very well designed and everything has a place to go into the box which makes things really really nice and easy to put away on top of that insert does go the game board when it's folded up but then on top of the game board we've got this tray right here which is wonderful all of the minis fit right inside this tray and i will continue to sort of gush about how much i really enjoy the quality of the minis in this game all of the player tokens fit right in there all of the pawns have their own space to go right in and then this also has a lid like you've come to expect from many of these awesome game trays trays that holds everything very nicely in there and that goes right on top of the main insert and the game board itself so i'm very very happy with the components and the inserts in this game meet me back up top and i'll let you know what i think about the game itself welcome back i hope you enjoyed the playthrough i do have to say right now that this is probably going to be a little bit different than my usual review or, or thoughts at the end of a video and in this case it will be much more actually just my final thoughts more than an in-depth review i didn't do a super deep dive into the solo game here and i'm not really coming here with a sort of analysis of how good this game is or how complex this game is or how well it works as a deep strategic solo game or anything along those lines as i mentioned in the introduction for this one i sort of had two goals in mind here and the first goal mainly was is this going to be a good game for me to introduce my nephew who's going to be six this summer to his sort of first big meaty thematic stri strategic kind of game and the second thing I was really curious about as a lover, a big lover of the main game Scythe, was just to see how much of Scythe comes through in this game. How much has changed to become its own game? Does it still feel like a good game? Does it feel watered down? These are the kinds of things that I was curious about going into this. And yes, of course, as a solo gamer who presents things as solo games, my playthrough was a solo game. All of my plays thus far have been solo games. So of course I will comment on how I feel the solo game works, but I'm not looking at this as a deep dive strategic, you know, disassembly or an analysis of this game. I just wanted to bring that up up front. With that being said, I have to say that I am a very, very big fan of this game. Now, of course, I've already talked about the components in my sort of component thoughts earlier. And the first thing that jumps out at me is this game is beautiful. Everything looks great. Those minis are wonderful. Just it oozes theme and, and world building. I mean, not, not necessarily story wise, but as far as the characters and the setting and everything that's going on here really pops. But beyond that, what Hobicho has done here as far as representing Scythe as a more general audience or younger audience focused game while still bringing across a lot of that same feeling of the original side is really 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 cool to me now let me get into a little bit more about what i mean about that so inside you've got your player board and every turn you're taking an action and in my little side in the same way you're selecting an action and a lot of those actions are similar Whereas in Scythe, you might be moving across the board or generating resources or using those resources to upgrade something. All of that still exists here. I'm still using my, my pawn to select an, act, select an action. And I can't take the same action two turns in a row. Granted, there is no top and bottom action, but those top and bottom actions are kind of separated into different actions in this game. The movement action is still here. But now I have to think about 
Do I move farther by myself or do I move a little bit less but bring my resources with me? And that's going to be important here because we'll talk about this more in a minute, but the resources aren't generated based on any specific spaces on the board. Inside, we're generating resources based on the type of location that your characters or your workers are in at any given time. Whereas here, the resources are, well, the locations of the resources are generated randomly. So in this case, if you want to hold on to those resources and you hold on to them the same way you do in the scythe, meaning you own all of the resources that are in the space that you are in at the time. You don't get to control any resources. So you have to consider how you're moving around the board with these resources. And now these resources, there's a new action here or a new scoring condition here that isn't inside and that I can trade in resources directly to get one of my scoring, my goal conditions to win the game. So you really have to control these resources, but I'm getting ahead of myself. We're talking about the actions. There's a move action. There's a generate resource action. There's using your resources to upgrade. In this case, you can upgrade your move action or that sort of buy action that you're actually using to build the upgrade in the first place. That's all there. The other big thing that's inside are the encounter cards. And in this case, you've got those quest cards that you're doing and they work just the same way. You get a really thematic picture of a story that's going on. You get to choose which of the things that you want to do in the story and you interact with them by spending resources or, or, or changing levels on your pie track or changing levels on your friendship track in this case, and, or which would have been your reputation track inside. So it's, it's very, very similar in that way. And then you've got the combat. Inside you move into a space that contains another player's you know, characters or mechs or workers, and you start a fight. Now in, in the case of Scythe, you lose reputation if you scare away the workers. In this case, you lose reputation just for, or friendship just for starting a fight because it's not very friendly to start a fight. But otherwise, the combat system basically works the same way. You set a dial based on your combat level in Scythe, or in this case, your pie fight level, you spend cards to add to that level, and then you compare that number with your opponent, whoever has the most wins. And it works just the way it does in Scythe. And it's not a difficult system to understand, so I think it works really well in either a younger player game or in the more complicated game of Scythe. And I think that's really, really cool that they brought that in here. Now, the difference is in Scythe, when you lose, you go back to your base and that's it. And whatever you left behind, you've left behind for the other player. Now, mostly that's true here too, except to sort of lessen the blow of completely just getting kicked back to your base, they've also included this thing that it, you either get some pies back or you get to take a magic card and you also get to then choose any action on your next turn. So it gives you this little bit of positive boost to help sort of lessen the blow of losing the, the, the combat or the pie fight in this case. But you still place your piece on that trophy track, which is that end game goal track, just like you would in the base game of Scythe. So the game has similar actions to Scythe. The combat system is very similar. That encounter or quest system is very similar. Um, and the game end is, is very similar. Now the difference here is whoever places their fourth trophy wins. I mean, you could get to a place where both people place trophies at the end based on that last round when you can place as many trophies as you can with whatever resources you have or abilities you have in that final turn. Whereas in Scythe, once that game is triggered, you're scoring points based on resources and based on your spot on the reputation track and the stars convert to points and how many spaces on the board you control. And they've gotten rid of all of that which is great because I think a lot of the complexity in Scythe comes from the double actions, that final end game scoring, and then maybe some of the difficult upgrading and interactive things that you get in Scythe. But otherwise, the core mechanics of Scythe are really not that complicated as far as select an action, take the action, gather resources, trade the resources in for something, hit these specific goals that you're trying to attain to get stars inside or trophies in this game and I, I think it works really well and it's it's just really cool that they've pulled out all these core mechanisms and rethemed them in a way that 
is more friendly for a younger audience, sure, but it doesn't baby anything. It's not pulling out any of the sort of strategic thought, really, aside from, of course, the more high-level concepts that a younger child might not be able to understand. So I really think that what's been done here is really, really cool. Now, there are a couple of other things that are added to this game that both add things and maybe take away a little bit. So let's talk about some of those differences. And the big thing here is the resources, right? I said in the original base game of Scythe, you generate resources based on the, the type of spaces that your workers are in when you take that action. In this case, you're not really generating, you're not growing, you're not farming, you're searching for things. So when you take this seek action, your choice is, do I wanna find more apples or do I wanna find more gems? But otherwise it's the same action. And you're gonna roll some dice and the dice are going to place the quest tokens, the apples and the gems at random locations on the board or at least random areas on the board. You get to select which space it goes on, but the die will determine where it goes on the board. And now for a, a serious gamer, this might be a bit of a problem because it brings in some real luck to the game because I could just keep rolling lousy and all of my resources could be very far across the board, closer to my opponent than to me. And that's gonna ruin things a little bit. But at the same time, it does add another level of sort of tactical thinking that needs to be thrown in there. And also, the cool thing about this is they've added this idea of sharing is a good way to create friendship. And the friendship track, which is what we are equating to the reputation track in main scythe, can be affected in this way. So when I roll a die and I place the resource, if I decide to place a resource on a spot where my opponent is, yes, I'm helping my opponent, but by helping my opponent, I'm being friendly and therefore my friendship value goes up. And one of the end game goals is to have a lot of friendship. So even if the resources aren't getting placed in a place that I want them to be, then I can use them to increase my friendship working towards a different goal. And I could always place them near my, my opponent and then have a pie fight, chase off my opponent and take those resources anyway. And the other nice thing is that there are those portals all over the board. So realistically, re regardless of where those resources go, the, the portals are putting me close enough that it's not that hard to get to wherever they end up. And I, I think that's not a big deal that there's luck in there, but it could be a problem if you're the kind of player who doesn't want that in there. But for a game for a younger audience, that luck is important, I think, because that luck is fun when you get something real close to you. And also it gives you that ability to give them to your friend or to your opponent in this case, that also adds a nice little flavor and theme to the game. So I, I, I don't have a big problem with the luck. I mean, otherwise this game is just, it's a lot of fun. It's not gonna be too hard, but there's a lot of stuff going on here that is very interesting. The upgrade abilities that we've already talked about, I haven't really sped, said anything specific about them. They're not gonna change any of the base things that are already there. They're only going to give you a little bit extra, right? So now maybe I can move from portal to portal for free, or maybe I can move directly into the castle, or maybe when I'm building things, instead of spending two apples to, to buy a pie, I have to only spend one apple to buy a pie, or there are different kind of combinations of things, but it doesn't change anything dramatically. It only manipulates things and alters things in a little bit of a way to push you towards different end goal you know, conditions. And I, I think that's really cool. So I am very pleased with what they've done turning Scythe into a young game. I am very pleased with the sort of balance of accessibility, but also depth. And I think that's a really cool balance here. The other really cool thing here is this Automa system. I mean, I am a big fan of everything that these guys do. Morton and his team are amazing. I love these Automas for all of these Stonemaier games. The side one has always been a bit of a difficult ask because figuring out the direction that the AI is going in and figuring out some of the decisions takes a little bit of thinking and what they've done here is a whole lot easier to understand, which is good because obviously this is not for the same level of gamer. I'm not sure that a child would ever play this solo, but maybe an older, you know, adolescent would definitely try it out. And the AI here works very well. So basically the movement is very easy to understand. It's always going for the most stuff possible. And then if 
if there's more than one option, it follows an easily understandable pattern. Otherwise, nothing else changes. If it shows me a seek action, it tells me exactly where to put things. If they end up in my space and they have enough pies to fight, they'll fight me. And the fight works just the same way it does for me, except they don't lose any friendship for fighting. But that's just because it's giving me a goal to pass. So it's really, really, really easy to follow the AI here. But it's still giving me a challenge because I need to pay attention to what the AI is collecting and how many resources they have because if they have too many resources, they're gonna get one of their trophies and I need to do what I can to stop them from doing that. So it might be that I need to have a pie fight quick to take away some of those resources or it might be that I need to find a quest that allows me to pull resources off the board in certain places, even if it hurts my friendship level. So it, it does make me think about it. Is it a super deep strategic solo game? No, it's not. But that's not what this is here for. There are difficulty levels, but the difficulty level is only going to change the level of the pie fight track that the AI starts at. So it just sort of changes the speed or the, the, the quickness at which it can get that end game goal for high, having a high score on the pie track. And it also changes the number of resources they need to score their other trophies. So it's basically just speeding up that sort of timer that you're trying to race against to finish the game before the AI does. And it does bring more challenge for sure. And it does make you have to pay more attention to fighting them for those resources or getting to those resources before they do or having a pie fight to strip them of resources before they trade them in for a trophy. But otherwise it doesn't really dramatically change the way the game plays. So if you're looking for a very variable solo game, if you're looking for a very strategic solo game, this is not gonna be that, but that's not why you're looking at this game. The other cool thing about the solo game, though, is that you can play a sort of team-based mode where you're both teaming up against a team of uh, Automa characters. And the reason I mentioned this solo and this team-based mode is because even if you're playing this game with a child who's a little bit younger than the game suggests should be ready for a game of this level, you can play this solo or team-based with your child and make the decisions together. And in that way, they can learn the way that the game plays. And after you see that they start to understand how the mechanics work, and after you see that they're really sort of starting to get comfortable with the game, that's when you can switch over into the real game and start playing against your child instead of with your child against the automa. And I think the ability to use a solo mode in that way to sort of train your child how to play the game before getting into the real competitive game is a really, really cool thing to have. So for that reason, I think the solo in this game is a great addition. I think it plays very well. And even for a parent who's got this game on the shelf for their child, it's a lot of fun to pull this out every once in a while and play through a solo game. It's a pretty quick play. It's, a, it's maybe a 30 minute playthrough. And there's enough of a bite, there's enough of a challenge to the solo game that it still makes it a whole lot of fun to play. And it's definitely one that I'll pull off the shelf and play, even if it's not one that I get into constantly. Because it really is a lot of fun and it gives you a lot of that scythe feel without giving you this long epic game and these really deep, meaty, grindy, brain challenge decision kind of things, right? This is a more light pull off and play through kind of game than it is set up and get into it kind of game. So with all that being said, again, I'm really pleased with what Hobicho has been able to do, converting Scythe into a more approachable, more accessible game for a younger audience. I think it looks great. I think it plays great. I think it's got enough different from the base game Scythe that it makes it its own unique game as well. I think this is a great sort of, not first game for your child for sure, but definitely first meaty game for your child. And I would strongly recommend that if you've got a child who's into board games and is probably looking for that next step to get into a more strategic style of board game, definitely check this one out. I think you would really enjoy it. With all that being said, I hope you enjoyed my video. If you did, please remember to like and subscribe below and I'll see you next time. Thanks.